Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kenzie Ferris. I am a wealth manager at Heritage Financial, working with individual clients on their day-to-day -day finances, whether it's investment portfolios, insurance, estate planning. We are here to help you get organized, to make sure you have a plan, and to be as prepared as possible for the unexpected. I've worked at Heritage for over 12 years. I'm a certified financial planner, accredited wealth management advisor, and I'm certified in long-term care insurance. I'm joined here today by my very own estate planning attorney who, and someone who I trust explicitly, Kelly Gill, who's a partner at Belcher Fitzgerald. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll let you give a little background on your practice and specialties. Kenzie, thank you very much. And thank you to Heritage for inviting me to join you on this presentation today. I have been an estate planning attorney for over 20 years. I initially started my career at a large firm in Boston and then moved to smaller firms. And now I'm at Belcher Fitzgerald. We have offices in Boston and in Needham. And my practice specializes solely in estate planning, trust and estate administration, and working with clients to help develop plans throughout the continuum of their lives. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, so let's dive right in. 90% of women will find themselves solely responsible for their own financial security at some point in their life. And being financially secure means being prepared even for the unexpected. Many women are planners, but some aren't. And then they find themselves quickly having to become a planner because they are thrown into an unexpected situation. What we want to get across today is that even if you aren't naturally a planner, there are things that you can do to gain control of your financial future. Kelly, given this statistic, what are some um, unexpected events that you see in practice? Yeah, I mean, we, when we first started talking about putting this presentation together, we really wanted to focus on women. But I want to say that the advice we're going to give applies to absolutely everyone. So men, women, anyone, absolutely all of this applies. Uh, the situations typically become when there's a divorce and the person who is now in charge of managing the finances never had to manage her finances before. Often in the event that a parent becomes ill or passes away, as an adult, you may become responsible for handling that administration. Often if you have um, the death of a spouse, unfortunately, you can be thrust into a situation where you're managing finances and trying to figure out how to spend money and where it should go upon your death. Um, also a situation where you have children who are now older and you set your plan in place when they were younger and now you need to be more financially responsible as you're starting to face retirement. Exactly. And the reality is that some women manage their finances, others are marginally involved, and some are not involved at all. But to plan for the unexpected, you have to maintain some involvement. At Heritage, uh, we encourage all clients to attend every meeting, but we understand that it's not possible sometimes or someone might not want to be as involved in every single meeting and that's okay. But we really encourage what we call the silent spouse to attend at least one meeting annually um, just to review your net worth statement, which is a list of your assets and liabilities so that you know where all of your accounts are held. Um, review your specific financial plan, of course, answer any questions that you have um, and also just keep the line of communication open since we will be one of the first calls you make if something does happen. What many women don't know is that if they tell their money what to do through a basic estate plan, um, they will be prepared for those unexpected events that Kelly had just mentioned. So Kelly, what's the easiest way for women to make sure that they are prepared even for the unexpected? So the best thing that people can do is to make sure that they have a plan in place. And there are a couple, the, the biggest mistake that people can make is by not having any plan at all in place or putting a plan in place and then sort of setting and forgetting it for 10 to 15 years and never looking back. Um, so I think if we go to the next slide, yeah, that'll help people. Okay, so the first um, most common mistake is just not having a plan at all, not having beneficiaries designated on life insurance or retirement accounts not having, when they talk about a strategy with asset titling, that means how do you own an account? So for example, if you have an account in your name alone with no designated beneficiary, no co-owner, and you pass away, 
that asset is going to have to go through probate court in order to get to your beneficiaries. If you have a will and you have designated beneficiaries, if you don't have a will at all, or you don't have a trust in place, then your assets are distributed to what we call heirs at law. And that is where the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has a structure in place that if you don't have a will, it tells you where your money is going to go. And that's sort of our worst nightmare, particularly for someone who is not married, because they may have beneficiaries that are not their parents or siblings that they want for assets to be distributed to. So when we talk about no strategy with asset titling, that's what we're talking about is how do you own your assets? Um, lack of trust or trust without funding, we're sort of hitting the highlights here and we'll go more deeply in a few minutes. But um, if you've set up trust, you've gone through the effort and you've met with your estate planning attorney and you've put a trust in place, but you haven't put any assets in the trust. That unfortunately essentially makes your assets have to go through probate to get to the trust or makes the trust totally inefficient. Not having a durable power of attorney is another really common mistake. So a durable power of attorney is effective while you're alive, but it gives someone who you trust the ability to handle your financial affairs if you are incapacitated or you're just unable to act because you're away. Um, it's really important to understand the difference between having a power of attorney um, and not having one. Um, the next most common problem is neglecting to share wishes with your family. They don't know where your assets are. They don't know where your estate planning documents are. Um, they don't know what your wishes are in the event that you pass away. They don't know if you want to be cremated. They don't know if you want to be buried. So that's that's something that we often will talk about with trying to not just direct money, but just direct, your, direct what you want to have happen. Um, and then failing to share passwords and access to documents. So many times when a person passes away, you know, we're left going through the mail to try and figure out what did this person actually own, going back and looking at you know, prior tax returns to say, okay, you know, where did they have accounts? And that can be really problematic and cause a long time to delay the, um, the estate administration in that situation. Absolutely. And we're going to be bringing that up, uh, that point up a few times during this conversation. Um, it's really important to have a list of your assets um, so that your family is not, like you just said, opening mail, waiting for quarterly statements or uh, monthly statements, um, trying to get in contact with custodians. So it, it definitely will save a lot of time by, by having that asset sheet already ready. Um, so avoiding these seven common mistakes that you see on this page here can uh, avoid a lot of stress um, for your loved ones. So Kelly, let's talk about how you help women prepare for the unexpected things that we just talked about. What are some of the basics that you make sure you are covering with all of your clients? Sure. So when Kenzie says all clients, I, we really mean all clients. It does not matter what your net worth is. If you have assets of $200,000 or you have assets of $20 million, you still need to direct where those assets go. So I think that's really important that our firm, we really, and I know with Heritage, really focus on making sure that everybody has a plan in place. And one thing that we say is use life events to trigger you to think about your estate plan. So what I tell clients is if you have any type of change in your family or your finances, at least touch base either with your estate planner or with your financial planner, to say, okay, given these changes, is my plan still good? So the first thing that we talk about is creating and updating a full list of assets and accounts. And I know that passwords change all the time. Some people have wonderful password managers. 90% of people who I work with do not have password managers. So even if you can give the most recent password, that can be helpful. Just on a spreadsheet that you update every couple of months. Um, that's extremely helpful. The next thing that we talk about is designating beneficiaries. So even if you have a, you're a single person and you have a bank account at Citizens, we want to avoid probate on that asset. You can go to the bank and designate someone as the payable on death beneficiary. If you pass away, that person goes to the bank with your death certificate and they're able to access those funds. Oftentimes that's better than adding someone as a joint owner, because if you add them as a joint owner, and they get a divorce, or they have a creditor, or, or you die first, and you didn't intend for the whole thing to go right away, 
Um, so what I say is just check, check your individual bank accounts, check your CDs. We know to designate beneficiaries on retirement accounts and life insurance, but often people forget about sort of those single accounts. Um, then the, the list of passwords, that I think goes right on top with creating and updating the full list of assets. Um, and then sharing the location of documents. You know, I don't think everyone needs to share their actual documents. People will say to me, should I share my estate planning documents? Not necessarily, because you may want to change it over time, and you may not want to hurt the feelings of the people who you've either designated to be guardian or designated to be trustee if you change your mind. But if you give loved ones or trusted individuals information to say, okay, my wealth advisor is Kenzie, they have copies of all of my documents. My estate planning attorney is so-and-so, you know, there's a copy of my documents in the top of my desk drawer, the firm has the originals. That's really, really helpful um, for children, for family members, um, if you're single, for your friends, for people to know where to go. Absolutely. Um, and at Heritage, we actually put together this document. This is not a legal document. Um, you don't need to fill this out and send it in for us. Just keep it filed um, in, in your own file cabinet. But this document will really um, make sure that you help share your intentions and that your intentions are understood. Um, who to call if something happens. Um, there's a section on here about family history, relationships, your values, um, just trusted advisors, and last wishes. So we're going to be sharing this document with you immediately following the webinar so that you can download that if you wish to just fill that out um, so that there is information there um, for you to share to share with your family. Um, okay, so there are some baseline things everyone should do that you just went over, Kelly, but in reality, not all solutions are one size fits all, correct? That's right. That's exactly right. Um, so one size that does fit all is we want to avoid probate of your assets. That fits all because the last thing you want is to have me or your estate planning attorney spending time and your money going to probate court. People think that because they have a will, it means they don't have to go to probate court. But having a will has to be probated in probate court. So it's important to have a will because you want to designate your personal representative, the person who's going to file your final income tax return, transfer your car at the Department of Motor Vehicles, um, transfer out all of the assets in your house. But what we don't want is significant assets passing through probate because it's at least a one-year period in Massachusetts. Creditors have one year to come forward, and the, you're not allowed as the personal representative to distribute all the assets out until that one-year period has lapsed. So that's a big goal of ours. Yes, we want for you to have a will, but we want to try and have your assets pass outside of that will. And there are three ways to do that. One is to have a jointly owned account. Two is to have a designated beneficiary. And three is to have an account owned by a trust before you die. Now, not all three of these buckets fit for every person. So for example, if you are single, you may not want to have joint account holders um, on your brokerage account. If you are married and you have a sizable estate, as an estate planner, we don't want for all of your assets to be jointly owned because we're going to miss out on some estate tax minimization, both in Massachusetts and potentially federally. So that's where as an estate planner and with Kenzie and with Heritage, we sit down and we say, okay, does it make sense to have your checking and savings account joint if you're married? Probably yes. If you're single, let's make sure you have a beneficiary on it. For your retirement accounts and your life insurance, primary beneficiary and contingent beneficiary. If your spouse dies and you have a joint account and God forbid it's a joint death, there's an accident, that account no longer has an owner. So now it has to go through probate. So does it make sense instead of having some things joint that they're actually owned by trust to avoid probate? I specifically worry about that with some of my senior clients because we can never predict who's going to pass away first, particularly um, with seniors or if one person may have um, some lack of capacity and wouldn't have the ability then to sign for assets. Um, and then the benefit of a trust is that it does avoid probate. And also if you do have assets 
that are subject to estate taxes, we can minimize those estate taxes. Um, an example of that, I just want to sort of give an example because this feels very um, esoteric right now. So let's say we have a couple and you're married and you have an $800,000 house and you have $400,000 in checking and savings and you have $800,000 between both of you in retirement accounts. So your total marital net worth is $2 million. In Massachusetts, you're allowed to leave your spouse an unlimited amount, totally estate tax-free. But when the spouse dies, the surviving spouse dies, that surviving spouse only has a $1 million exemption. So we lost that first spouse's exemption by having everything either jointly owned or by designated beneficiary. Instead, for couples who have $2 million or more, we would want to talk about setting up trusts where each of you would have a trust and we would split up the assets so that we can maximize each of your million dollar exemptions. The benefit of that in Massachusetts is just over $100,000 of state tax savings on the second spouse's death. So it can be significant. Um, that's what we talk about when we say making your money work for you, directing where you want your money to go. It's really thinking through all the various options and making sure that the designations are correct. Great. And one thing that we um, have noticed before, whether it's clients coming to us or prospects coming to us, um, they have those trust documents set up and established, but they might not be funded. So it's very important to make sure that, yes, you have that piece of paper, you have your trust document, um, it's been executed, but you need to make sure that you fund your fund your trust. And so, and again, that's just retitling assets and updating beneficiaries. Um, great. So as Kelly mentioned, every client situation is unique. Um, at Heritage, we do review your net worth statement every time that we meet to make sure that we're capturing everything um, and that all your assets are titled properly and beneficiaries are up to date according to your wishes. Uh, once a year, we also review a comprehensive wealth management summary that reviews your goals, accomplishments, any planning uh, recommendations that we're working on together. We do review insurance. Um, we do review um, your estate planning documents. Um, so we're having these conversations with clients on a regular basis, to, again, to make sure that your plan is going to work the way that you um, are intending it to work. Um, it's important to have a plan that fits your needs and to also realize, as Kelly had mentioned in the beginning, that your needs change over time. So it's really important to revisit your estate plan um, as often as, as these life events do come up. Um, and then, Kelly, if there are no big life events going on, how often do you recommend um, someone updating their estate plan? So I, I say not more than every five years. I think sometimes people can get sort of obsessive about worrying about it, but if nothing's going on, look at it every five years. What I find is that sometimes maybe your children were younger and you had payout provisions and now your children are all grown and they're independent and you can simplify your plan. So it isn't always as you get older, things get more complicated. Sometimes we're able to simplify but also it could be situations in your children's lives, if you have children or any beneficiaries' lives to have, um, let's say they're going through a divorce. You know, you're a single person and you named three cousins to be beneficiaries and one of them is going through a divorce or one of them has creditor problems or one of them is, is what we call a spendthrift, which means that they have difficulty controlling their spending. If that's the case, then you can always go back and say, you know what, I want to amend my estate planning documents so that when I'm no longer here, these funds are preserved for that person. So not more than every five years, um, your estate planner should be sending you an email um, or contacting you if there's a significant change in the tax laws that require an update. So certainly barring that, but, um, but every five years or unless either yourself or the beneficiaries who you've named have something significant going on. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so again, this isn't a one and done project. There, there are going to be changes and revisions that you will make over time. Um, and Kelly is very proactive about um, reaching out to her clients when there are changes in the estate laws or just sending that reminder. And then, of course, we are mentioning this um, almost on a quarterly basis when we meet with our clients. So let's jump to a few women specific strategies. Kelly, can you talk a little bit about the use of trusts? Yeah. 
So for anyone who is not married, I tend to recommend a trust. And the reason is because in a trust is where you can say, during my lifetime, all of the assets are 100% for my benefit. And then when I pass away outside of probate, the person who I name as trustee is able to collect those assets and distribute them. So that is, uh, you know, for anyone who's not married, I highly recommend a trust. For a piece of real estate, you're not able to designate a beneficiary on real estate the same way that you are um, on a brokerage account or on a bank account or on life insurance. So for people who have real estate, um, sometimes it makes sense to own it with your spouse if you're married, but certainly if you're single or there are reasons either for estate tax or creditor protection purposes that we don't want to have the house jointly owned, the trust is a great way to do that. There are also trusts that we can set up for people who are concerned about um, nursing home care in the future. Those are types of irrevocable trusts. There are also irrevocable trusts that we can use for you to make gifts to children if you don't want for them to have the money outright, but you want it to be held for their benefit. Um, when you're alive and your trust is 100% your asset, there's no additional income tax filings. But you can set it up to say, if I pass away and a person is under the age of 21, they don't get the money outright. It gets spread out over time. So a third at 25, a third at 30, a third at 35. Certainly, if you have any beneficiaries who have special needs, it would be really important for us to embed supplemental needs trust language in so that the beneficiary does not lose access to any government programs that they otherwise may be entitled to. Um, and then again, even for many people who have adult children, who if they're worried about potential divorces of their children, that's a great time for us to use trusts. Definitely great. Um, the next bullet point here we have is divorced. Um, so uh, one thing that we wanted to point out, and this is for Massachusetts only, um, after you do get divorced, your, your existing estate planning documents are no longer valid. So if you had your spouse listed in your estate planning documents, um, in certain uh, positions, if something were to happen to you, um, those documents are no longer valid. So it's important that you update your estate plan after you're divorced. Um, and also it's really important to make sure that you update your beneficiaries on retirement accounts, life insurance, that transfer on death, payable on death, uh, beneficiary designations that Kelly was talking about for bank accounts. Um, so it's really important uh, to make sure that you update those if you do get divorced. Yeah. So it's treated as if your spouse died is essentially what happens. So every time that you had named your spouse, either as a beneficiary or as the personal representative or as any other role, that part is all null and void. And that's why it's really important to revisit it. Great. And one other thing, Kelly, I'm um, just um, a lot of times we see that uh, clients will list their spouse as primary, and then they potentially list their children as contingent beneficiaries. And God forbid the children were under the age of 18 at that time, and it does skip over the ex-spouse, um, then you're stuck with um, the assets going to children under the age of 18, but they wouldn't te technically go to the children at that time. So you want to talk a little bit about how that would impact, impact things? Sure. If the children were listed outright um, minors. Yeah, so we see this all the time, honestly, with um, retirement accounts and um, retirement accounts as well as with life insurance. So technically, a person who's under eighteen is not allowed to own or is not allowed to own it. So as a result, what would happen in that situation if both spouses were deceased, or if you're single and you name your children as beneficiaries, or you name any minors as beneficiaries, is the person who you designate as guardian in your will, also called a conservator, has to go to probate court to petition to manage those assets for the benefit of the child. And then probate court has control over those assets in terms of making sure that they're managed for the benefit of the child until they reach the age of majority. The probate court's always going to be concerned that anybody who's designated as a guardian or conservator is, is going to essentially not use the funds the way they should use the funds. So it's important for us to try and avoid that. Sometimes what we do as planners in order to avoid it, if a person is close to the age of 18, is we end up letting the money sit 
in either the life insurance account or in the retirement account and not collecting it until until the person reaches the age of majority. But that's not always ideal. What we prefer instead in that situation is naming a trust as the beneficiary where the trustee has immediate authority outside of the court to collect the assets, invest them in the trust, and then distribute the assets according to the trust. So many times I'll say, please designate your spouse as the primary beneficiary. But if you have very young children and you have significant resources, it may make sense to set a trust up to be sort of a holding tank as the contingent beneficiary. Great, thank you. Um, charitable giving. Many clients want to leave funds to charitable organizations. Um, Kelly, what are some examples you can share around this approach? Yeah, so the absolute most tax efficient way to leave assets to a charity or to any nonprofit is through your tax deferred retirement accounts. So for example, if you want to leave um, half of your retirement account to St. Jude, and you do that, those funds are not included in your estate for estate tax purposes because it went to a nonprofit. And then the assets, when they go to the nonprofit beneficiary are not subject to income taxes because a charity received it. So take, for example, a situation where um, a person wants to leave uh, their two siblings money and they leave them $500,000 through an IRA. That IRA is included in the owner's estate for estate tax purposes, and then the beneficiaries pay income taxes when they take it out. If instead they left the um, charitable beneficiary um, through the IRA, no estate taxes and no income taxes. So that's something I always try to encourage, but many times people will say, well, I wanna leave $10,000 each to five different beneficiaries. Certainly we can set that up in a trust, you can have the asset um, flow to the trust, and then the trustee simply writes the checks to the nonprofits. Those funds would still be excluded from your estate for estate tax purposes. Perfect, great. And then the last bullet point here we have um, is, is, is death. And while there are a number of tasks that need to be completed when a loved one does pass away, um, I feel like I can't stress enough the importance of having an active estate planning attorney involved, a financial planner, an accountant who, who work well together, who collaborate well together. Um, we have also brought this up several times in the webinar, but one of the biggest issues is, um, is we see is not having that list of assets um, where, where are the accounts held? Um, it, it, are there missing beneficiaries on certain accounts? Did you never add beneficiaries? Um, assets not titled properly, missing the usernames and passwords, trying to figure out all that, that information can be extremely stressful and time consuming, as Kelly had mentioned in the beginning. Um, when a loved one passes away, the last thing you want to do is worry about where the assets are held. It can be a full time job trying to track down that information. Um, so during this process, what we typically see is there are some um, spouses who want to get everything done right away. Um, and then start their grieving process, or it could be um, a spouse who is just trying to make it through the day. So we only can do a couple of things at each time. So the way that we will work with um, someone who has lost a loved one is that we will um, work on a process that works for you at that time. Um, and, and again, every client situation is unique and we are here to help as much as we can lift the burden off of your plate. Um, but there are things that you can do now uh, to be as prepared as possible for these unexpected events that we have mentioned today. So just a, a quick recap here. Um, do the easy baseline planning that we've talked about. Um, you need a plan, whether it's basic or complex, whether it changes over time, it depends on your situation, um, but you need a plan in place. Estate planning is not is not just for the rich. Um, again, there are things that you can do today on your own to put yourself in the best situation as possible. Do those things, be prepared. We're gonna send out a downloadable copy of the Reflections on My Heritage document that I had uh, presented in this webinar. Um, and then also um, talk to us about what strategies are good for you um, for avo avoiding probate. 
So after the webinar, there will be a, um, a brief survey that will automatically pop up on your screen. Uh, we'll also be sharing a replay of the webinar. Um, again, that'll be sent to your email right after meetings. And I wanna take a couple of questions. So let me just see what we have here in the Q&A Q &A box. So Kelly, uh, one of the questions I see here is, what is the difference between a durable power of attorney and an executor? Ah, it's a great question. A durable power of attorney is only valid while you're alive. So as soon as you pass away, the durable power of attorney ends. A durable power of attorney gives the person who you name the power to handle any of your financial affairs. So let's take, for example, a married couple and they're both their names are on the house. And God forbid one of them is in an accident and is incapacitated in the hospital. And the spouse who's at home wants to sell the house. He or she will not be able to sign your name if you're incapacitated on that deed. They would have to go to court and request a guardianship over you to sign your name. So just because it's joint doesn't mean you can sign the other person's name. If you have a power of attorney in place, that power of attorney would have the authority to sign your name. The same is true for tax deferred retirement accounts. Those are in your own name. If you become incapacitated and you need to take a required minimum distribution or those funds need to be used for your nursing home care, you don't have anybody designated as a power of attorney. No one can do that for you. The power of attorney is one of the most important documents, in my opinion, that you can have trying to direct your money where to go. As soon as my children turn 18 years old, I have them sign a power of attorney because I can't access any of their information. I can't help them with any of their financial affairs that are in their name alone without that power of attorney. So power of attorney handles your assets while you're alive. The personal representative, which used to be called an executor in Massachusetts, is responsible for your will, for your probate assets. Keep in mind that when we talk about a trust or joint owner in a will, a joint owner of an asset, or we talk about a beneficiary designation, those three things trump your will. So if all of your assets are either jointly owned or have a beneficiary or in a trust, your personal representative of your will does not have access to those. Beneficiaries trump will. That's important to keep in mind. Great. The only other thing I see here is um, we have someone who does not often attend uh, review meetings and ha just how to get involved. So um, please feel free to reach out to your wealth manager, your wealth advisor at Heritage. Um, join us for your next meeting, whether it's in person or via Zoom. Um, we're also more than happy if you don't like the meeting setting, we're more than happy to go out to lunch or coffee with you as well. So it is important to be involved in your finances. Um, as much as you're comfortable with, um, and at least try to attend one meeting a year. Uh, we definitely find it very beneficial for clients. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And Kelly, thank you so much again for, for joining us today. And if anyone has any additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out and give us a call. And we hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Kenzie. Bye.